No labdi en vithium, un tagad mane lioti lils kauns, mane ja turpina anglu valod. Ta peits ka mana latvish valod, ti kai nautik laba, kas varu skaidron gaish runat no skatova. So, in English, and thank you very much for being understanding. So, I'm here to talk about learning. And I have a, a lot of experience of learning from my career and also personal life. So my career, I spent uh, over 20 years at British Airways uh, managing and developing commercial teams. And I also led the learning and development department. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've worked as a consultant and trainer with very different organizations. So last year, I worked with the Houses of Parliament in London Unfortunately, I couldn't stop Brexit. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I also worked with a holiday resort in the Caribbean. That was a great job. This year, I'm working with the Intercontinental Hotel Group, and next week, I'm going to be with Manchester Airport. So my theme for my session is about learning needs action. So in other words, learning needs us to either think something or do something differently as a result. But it can be challenging translating learning into action, as we shall see. So here are the British cycling team. So I'm going to take you back in time to 2012 and somehow a bit of a better world for the UK. So the British cycling team, their coach, Sir Dave Brailsford, had a lot of pressure on him to bring home the gold medal for Britain. Very interestingly, what he decided to do was not to focus on their cycling skills, but instead he tried to improve every single thing that they did by just 1%. So he looked at what they ate, he looked at how they slept. He even looked at how they washed their hands to make sure that they didn't um, spread germs and get sick before the big race. It worked. They took home the gold medal. He now has a second career advising businesses about his theory of marginal gains. So that is how the sum total of lots of very small things can make a big difference. In effect, this is learning or continuous improvement at work. So you may be thinking, well, actually, what has this got to do with us here in this concert hall? Well, you're all at a conference. I am presuming that you want to learn something from being here, because after all, you've invested a day of your time. You've also invested some money to be here. Actually, that might not be true, because maybe you're spending someone else's money. And if so, actually, that's much better, isn't it? Nonetheless, you've made an investment in time and money to be here. You all bring different experiences. So you have different jobs, you're different ages. You will have different experience, different things that you want to get out of today. So in other words, not everything that is spoken about here today will be relevant for everyone. So this is about thinking about what 1% marginal gain learnings can I take away from today and put into practice. So in other words, what has made me think today? And what am I going to think or do differently when I get back to the workplace? So what I want to do now is to talk about the process of transferring learning into the workplace. So I'm going to start by sharing some research. So this research was done with the Xerox organization and Professor Neil Rackham, a guru in sales. He spoke in Riga, I think, a year ago, so some of you may have heard him speak. Um, very interesting guy. So when you go on a training course, you learn a new skill, and by definition, your skill levels should go up, as you can see on the chart. What the Xerox organization wanted to know was how much more would skill go up when people got back from work. So this is the interactive part. 
Could you put your hands up if you think that there was a big increase in skill? Anyone think there was a big increase in skill? Nobody. What about a small increase in skill? Anyone? Yep, some of you think a small increase. What about no further increase? Some of you? And what about a decrease in skill? Anyone think there was a decrease? <gasps> a brave person over here, and you are absolutely right. There was a decrease, and you may be surprised to see how much. 87% of learning lost within a month. So you might very well be thinking, well, isn't training a bit of a waste of time if we lose so much after just a month? Now, why is that? Well, if you think about it, real life gets in the way. So you leave a training course hopefully full of ideas. So think about yourselves when you go back to work on Monday. Hopefully you've got ideas of things you want to take away and do differently. But actually, when you get back to work, there'll be unanswered phone calls, emails, real life kicks in. The other thing is that sometimes we try a new skill back at the workplace, and it's just more difficult than we thought it would be. So if you've got a notebook and some paper in front of you, what I'd like you to do is just try signing your name with the other hand to the one that you normally use. So if you're right-handed, you're left-hand. If you're left-handed, you're right-hand. This is partly to check that you're still awake, by the way. So how did that feel? Easy? Difficult? A little bit awkward. And that's exactly what it feels like when we learn a new skill. So if I now said to you, I want you to sign 50 forms in 10 minutes, what you would, of course, do is revert to using your normal hand, because it's quicker, faster, and get results. And this is what happens with learning. So is there anything that can be done to stop the skills decrease? Here is what smart organizations do. Two things. Managers reinforce learning through feedback and coaching. They also create the right environment to try new things. And if they do that, you can reverse the 87% skill loss. So let's just briefly, and you, you can see actually there's the skill, if you look at the chart, skill kind of goes up a little bit and then stabilizes. And actually the blue line underneath is results. So results then start to go up and stabilize as new skills um, kick in. So we're going to talk briefly about, or I'm going to talk briefly, about feedback and coaching and the right environment. So we all know that we should do feedback and coaching. And yet, is feedback really and truly alive in your organization? You don't need to answer it, but it's a really good question to think about. So when was the last time that you personally gave someone feedback? When was the last time that somebody actually gave you feedback? How much coaching really happens? So feedback, here's a definition that I am often given when I go into organizations. Feedback is when my manager tells me off for doing something wrong. And yet, isn't the purpose of feedback to encourage or improve performance? So on this chart, you can see encouraging at the top, uh, and improving at the bottom. So I'm going to bring this to life for you, different types of feedback. And I like to use a playing cards analogy. So if at the end of my session, I were to say to you, how was my session? Give me some feedback. If you were to say, great session, I would love you forever, and you would all become my new best friends. That's how superficial a person I really am. Now, what you've just given me there is heart feedback. It comes from the heart, not specific, it's really encouraging. If you were to say, I loved the way you involved everyone by asking questions, it also encourages me, but it's very specific. So it encourages me to continue specific behaviors or skills that work. So in other words, next time I would give this presentation, I would make sure to keep asking questions. I call that diamond back, because as every, every woman in the audience knows, diamonds are the most valuable stones. Could someone please tell my husband that? <laughs> Down at the bottom right now, 
if you were to say to me, I don't know why you bothered turning up today, apart from the fact that I would never speak to you again, possibly burst into tears, um, etc., take you off my Christmas card list, this is actually not feedback. It's not feedback because it doesn't in any way encourage me or show me how I can improve my performance. It's, in fact, criticism. And that's why I've put the club there, the uh, card sign for club, because it's like you're clubbing me around the head. However, if you were to say, you know what, your session would have had more impact if you delivered it in Latvian, that tells me something that I can improve and something that I can work with. So when we give feedback as managers to try and uh, encourage learning, we need to make sure that we give both the encouraging feedback and the improving feedback. And what's really interesting is that if we give more encouraging feedback, people are much more likely to act on the improving feedback because it feels fair and balanced. One of our deepest needs is the need to be appreciated. Somebody much cleverer than me said that. I think it might have been Gandhi. So, let's now turn to coaching. There's really only one thing to say about coaching, and that is, I believe that the reason we don't do as much coaching as we should do is our belief that coaching takes a long time and is difficult. Let me introduce you to coaching in the moment. So, here's two people at a water fountain. Now, although I'm married to an actor, my acting skills are terrible. Very wooden. I need some coaching. So, um, you're off to the planning meeting today, aren't you? Yes, I'm running it today. See how bad they are. What's your objective for it? Um, I need to get agreement to extend the deadline on our next deliverable. What's the problem? Um, I was too optimistic about the new technology being ready. Tough one. How are you planning to get buy-in? And so on and so on. So what we can see here is a coaching conversation happening very quickly at a water fountain. This is coaching in the moment, because at its most simple, coaching is about helping someone to think through a problem or to improve a skill. This is also just-in-time coaching. So in other words, it's before this person goes off to a meeting. It will help them to get a better result from that meeting. Whereas most organizations do just after time coaching. In other words, after the meeting, let's talk about how it went, but it's too late then to do anything differently. So in terms of putting learning to work, little and often is the way to go with coaching. Coaching in the moment, little and often, just in time coaching. The other thing that great organizations do is to create the right environment in which to try new things. So this is all about encouraging people to have a go. Now, if you're going to encourage people to have a go at doing something differently, you need to accept that, guess what? They will make mistakes. And instead of blaming them from that, we need to allow, allow and learn from mistakes. What's more, if we can share that learning, then everybody learns. So, a couple of years ago, I was running a training program in Japan, a negotiation skills course. And I got two people role-playing, and one of them really, really badly messed it up. So he gave everything away, didn't do all the nice things we'd talked about. And at the end, he said, I'm so sorry, that was terrible. And I said to him, thank you. Thank you for what you did. Because by doing that in a safe environment, in a classroom, you will never, ever do that in front of a customer. So, you know, don't practice in front of a customer. What's more, every single person around you has also learned from watching you do that. So it's a great way of sharing learning and saying it is OK to make mistakes. So it's not just managers' responsibility to create the right environment, it's also our role. We need to push ourselves out of our comfort zone into our stretch zone. The point of maximum learning is on the edge of stretch and panic. When we get into panic zone, actually we can't learn anything uh, because we're paralyzed. So, as managers, it's really important... Sorry, I need to have a quick water break. As managers, it's really important that we don't push people into their panic zone. As individuals, it's important that we push ourselves out of our comfort zone. One of the ways I do that is to always say yes and not no. But that's not always easy. 
because here are some of the things that get in the way. Fear of being wrong, fear of failure, rejection, and so on. I'm sure we can all recognize this. When Martin rang me up and asked me to come and speak here today, I said yes, not no, but secretly, I was really hoping that I wouldn't be able to make the date, because I thought, then I'll have said yes, but I don't have to actually do it, because it will be terrifying. And of course, I had all these fears. What if I stand up here, forget my words? What if I run over time? What if, what if? He sent back the date, and I realized to my horror that I could make it. So here I am, ladies and gentlemen, well and truly out of my comfort zone. However, I think there's a lot that we can learn from our failures. So two things I'd like to highlight. Firstly, let's make a virtue of some of our failures. Because if you think about it, our failures are how we have developed and become the people that we are today. Because when we do something wrong and we share it, we learn from it, we become stronger, we understand that we can face challenges and overcome them. Most importantly, we understand that when we make a mistake, the world actually doesn't end, even though we think it will. Um, I really like this idea. This is my failures CV. Um, oh, please don't take a picture of it. <laughs> I didn't realize it might actually go out onto the internet. Here are the many failings of Trudy Jagera. Um, I'm only joking. But the idea here is I just thought of some of the mistakes that I'd made through my career and what I'd learned from it. So the key thing is making sure that we put in what we've actually learned from that. The other thing, and this is question time again, when we're learning something new and getting out of our comfort zone, should we focus more on quality, i.e. doing something really, really well before we have a go, or should we focus more on quantity, so doing something as many times as possible? So can you put your hands up if you think it's quality? Okay, so we have a few perfectionists in the audience. What about quantity? Okay, probably about the same, I think. Um, actually, what research shows is it's much better to focus on quantity. So in other words, doing something as many times as you can and then working on the quality. Otherwise, if we wait until it's perfect, we'll simply never do it. So if you think of learning a language, this is absolutely true. We need to simply start speaking, making mistakes, feeling a bit stupid, and then look at improving the quality, improving grammar, improving um, vocabulary, and so on. So and then quality will follow. And that's really useful for managers as well. When you're trying to get a learning environment going, encourage people to do it. And the more they do it, the more they will learn. So we've talked about uh, managers' responsibility, talked about our responsibility. Last thing I'd like to talk about briefly is learning from our customers. So many of us learn from our customers by getting feedback and acting on it. What I'd like to do is show you a slightly different approach and that is actually seeing things as our customers do. So last year, I ran a workshop for the leadership team of a large train organization in the UK. In the middle of the workshop, I asked them to go out and take a train journey. This was quite a risky strategy, actually. I didn't know if they'd actually come back. What I wanted them to do was get on the train and see the journey as their customers do. So to encourage that process, I gave each of them a different scenario. So I asked one person to pretend they were French and couldn't speak any English, to see how easy it was to make their way through the station. I gave somebody else two heavy suitcases, and it was someone my size, not a man, to see how easy it would be to pretend they were going to the airport. I asked somebody else, I even had somebody in a wheelchair with someone else acting as their carer. When they went off to do the exercise, I was really nervous because these guys traveled on the train every single day to get to work. And I thought they might say, what are you doing? We know this stuff. It was one of the most impactful exercises I have ever run. By accident, I have to say. Because what happened when they came back with was, they said things like, I have never bought a ticket in our ticket machine because they had free passes. I had no idea how difficult our ticket machines are to use. They said things like, it's really hard to find your way around a station. It's a miracle that any of our customers actually get onto the right platform. But the key learning here 
was to see things as their customers did and not as a senior manager in an organization. Here's another example, totally different. This is Great Ormond Street in London, Children's Hospital. There were lots of problems getting kids to go through the MRI scanner, lots of crying. The doctors blamed the nurses, and they said, you know, you need to be kinder, more sympathetic, that's the problem. The nurses said, that's not what's going on. They persuaded the doctors to go into the room on their knees. So in other words, the height of a five-year-old, and look at the MRI scanner. And then they understood that it was terrifying. So this is their solution. They painted it like a pirate ship. And trust me, after that, kids wanted to go into the MRI scanner. The learning is the same. When we see things through our customers, we don't fall into we-know-what-they-want syndrome, which is dangerous for any customer business. My last story, I work with an airline in the Far East. They had just built a new check-in area for first-class passengers with lovely, comfortable seats, water fountains, flowers, and so on. And a numbering system so that you knew when it was your turn to be served. When I interviewed the customers, they hated it. They hated it because they said, we want to be treated like people, and yet you're giving us a number. And actually, when we have these numbers, it reminds us of being in a bank. And for most of us, being in a bank is not always a pleasant experience. Apologies if there are people here working for banks. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. So avoiding we know uh, what they want syndrome. Learning is the same. When we see things through our customers' eyes, we learn. So here's a summary of what I've talked about. We've talked about making learning work from managers, what they need to do, what we need to do and learning from our customers by seeing things as they do. But I want to finish with a personal story. So we have a saying in English, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Very sadly, I have to admit that I am an old dog. I had a big birthday uh, two weeks ago. However, in defense of old dogs, when I arrived in Latvia, some of you will know from my surname, Javas, that I married into a family of skiing gods. I, a girl from London, had never been on skis. So at the age of 49, I got on skis for the first time. And I went through the process that we have just described. So that is, I pushed myself out of my comfort zone. I focused on, qu on quantity. I went up and down Jagakans 100,000 times before looking at quality and trying to improve uh, what I was doing. I got feedback and coaching from my husband and his sons. So now I can say, I can ski. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Final words to Henry Ford with this wonderful quote. Thank you for listening. Thank you most especially. So thank you, thank you most especially for listening to me in English. Na kamreis, Latviski.